Tangent colon. Tangent colon. Tangent colon. Tangent colon. Hey, welcome to another episode of Tangent Calling, the podcast where we go off on weekly tangents based on the content of the books we publish, covering everything from music to street art to politics to pubs to pirates to foraging for mildly psychedelic tea, if that's your thing. Uh, My name is Sol, and this episode we are presenting you exclusively with one of the highlights from the recent Bristol Festival of Literature. So this will be a webinar that uh, was hosted by Richard Jones, you know, the man who believes there's a small ghost called Pierre living in the Landogger Trail. And um, he is going to be interviewing three of Georgia's leading writers. And together they're going to be covering everything from Georgia's uh, incredibly uh, fascinating literary scene uh, to... Harry Potter translations to uh, postmodernism and pastiche. It's a really, really fascinating discussion. I think you guys are really going to love it. Uh, Hopefully you learn something as well. But before we begin, I've got to ask you guys, please hit the like, hit the subscribe. It really, really helps us out so, so much. And it will will let us keep making these if you enjoy them. So um, please do that. And also, please head over to the Tangent Books website. I'll put a link in the description again because, as always, uh, we're going to give you another 10% discount code. Um, This week it will be Georgia, uh, just capital letters. And you can get 10% off all of the fiction on the Tangent Books website uh, in honour of our three amazing fiction writers that we're going to be talking to this episode. Um, so that covers everything from Stanley Donwood's Household Worms to Mike Manson's Where's My Money. Uh, there's so much great fiction on there. Check it out. Uh, it will make a brilliant Christmas present um, or something to you know get you through this cold winter. So uh, yeah, thanks for listening and uh, I really hope you enjoyed this talk. I'll leave it to Richard. Take it away. Okay, well, people are still are still joining us, but I'm going to make a start. So, welcome everybody to uh, the Bristol Festival of Literature, Georgia Calling. Special welcome to our guests all the way from Tbilisi and uh, uh, Ambassador Sophie Katsarava in London. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Um, so just a little bit of context for this. The, the festival is, um, is run entirely by volunteers. We uh, were celebrating our 10th anniversary this year and um, we, um, we don't get any public funding. So everybody involved with the festival, particularly this year, has, uh, has donated their time for free. It's entirely voluntary. So the best way that you can show your appreciation for that is by supporting the authors by buying their books and supporting their work. So. Um, a little bit about twinning in uh, uh, the, the background to this. So uh, Bristol is very much one of the early pioneers of the twinning movement, uh, which was based on a spirit of peace and reconciliation and building a Europe based on cooperation after the Second World War. And, and uh, Bristol has seven twin cities across the across the world, one of which being Tbilisi. And in the, in the mid 1980s, uh, uh, people in Bristol began to reach out to Tbilisi and the aim of making friends. With, with our then so-called enemies, that was the that was what, uh, and uh, uh, during the Cold War years, so it was very much a, a, a way of, of international hope and international friendship, and um, we, did, we 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 were trying to undermine the Cold War rhetoric, and the Twinning Agreement was uh, was reached in 1988, so about uh, uh, three years before the end of the, uh, the Soviet um, uh, the break of the Soviet Union. And there's been a lot of incredible projects in the, in, in, in the, uh, since then, um, many of which have got a cultural identity. And uh, the, um, uh, it's, it's well documented in a, in a book in the Central Library. And the Tbilisi, Bristol Tbilisi Twinning Association has always supported cultural exchanges and uh, has set up uh, the Georgian Choir, for example, and is a, a developing artists with the, uh, the Upfest Street Art Festival and at Spike Island 
and we're very the Twilling Association says they're very very proud to uh, to support tonight's event. And we're very honoured tonight to be joined by the Georgian ambassador Sophie Katsarava, who's going to say a few words of welcome. Mm -hmm. So, ambassador, over to you. Didi Madloba, Moges Almebit, Sir Fasas Tumbebo, Didi Madloba Minda Butra, Festival is organised at Ebs from Moments of Sasha Leba Mugmartot, Samso Harods as virtual Rad, Magram, Mugetesimo Maurici Meditrum, Shendek Els, Festival, it shall be formed at each other, the other Pira de Chevre. You will sell maybe Festival is Pala Monatiles, the Sakar Tolodan, Tamo Matneles, Akamus Chilades, Ekatima Mishwins, Tamas, Tama de Buda, Sasia Mus, Akamus, we should have Pala. Now I will speak English. Dear members of the festival organizing committee, distinguished participants and guests, on behalf of the Georgian Ministry of Culture, Tbilisi City Council and the Georgian Embassy in London, may I welcome you to this evening's Georgia Calling event about Georgian literature as part of the Bristol Festival of Literature. I would like to congratulate the festival organizers and supporters of, for achieving 10 years of promoting grassroots and community-based literature across your beautiful city. It is an honor for Georgia to be this year's official country partner, and I'm delighted to be able to say a few short words of welcome. Bristol and Pilisi have a very special bond. The friendship of these two beautiful twin cities already counts 32 years. I personally have been following and supporting the Twinning Association since my very first encounter in 2005. Not quite 32 years, but 15 fruitful, productive, friendly years are more than enough to become an ardent supporter of this Twinning Association. With all the years long experience, lasting relationship goes far beyond the formal cooperation, encouraging new contacts, innovative ideas, informal ties in all spheres of life. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Mr. Derek Pickup, who does not need any introduction from me, for his outstanding and continuous efforts in making our team even stronger. I'm delighted that despite so many challenges and obstacles that the pandemic has imposed on all of us, today's event is still taking place, albeit distantly. Georgian literature is one of the ancient and richest in the world, and it is so encouraging to see that there are more and more events like this evening where prominent Georgian literary figures speak and promote Georgian literature. I believe Georgian participants will give us more detailed pictures and overview of literary landscape in Georgia. And on that note, I would like to wish all who join the event to have an inspiring and enlightening evening and express hope that despite uncertain and peculiar times, very soon you will be able to visit Tbilisi, which is always a very dynamic and welcoming city. Thank you once again, and now over to Richard Jones, who has been instrumental and got, along with Alex Hughes and Georgian colleague Nino Beglarishvili in Tbilisi to pull this evening together so successfully. Once again, wish you a very successful evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. So um, our Georgian guests tonight are David uh, Gabunia, Eka Kavanishvili, and uh, and uh, and Gio, who writes in the name of uh, Aka Morchikzade. Sorry about the pronunciation. No, uh, forget uh, about it. So, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm sorry. I, I, should, I should have. Uh, That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> so uh, we're very honoured to have you here tonight. These are three of the leading figures in uh, in Georgian literature. So Aka is a is a poet and journalist um, with a particular interest in internal politics and um, and and also. Uh, in investigative journalism, she's um, she's written uh, uh, various anthologies of poetry, award-winning volumes, and has been widely translated. Um, her uh, the 2000 to 2014, she received the Sabra Award for the best poetry collection of the year. Now, uh, Georgi Ashkabidani is uh, writes as Eka Morchiladze and um, is one of the or the best-selling um, author in uh, in the modern. Georgian era. His work is, uh, uh, is, is rooted in the reorientation of earliest, early 21st century Georgian literature and, and I think it's fair to say it's got uh, uh, a Western influence which is uh, fairly recent to, um, uh, to, the, uh, uh, to, to um, Georgian literature. 
And, uh, and finally, David Gabunia is a Georgian translator, award-winning playwright and author, and his debut novel, Falling Apart, was published in 2017 and became a bestseller in Georgia. It's also been translated into German. And uh, David has also got the unusual distinction of being the person who translated Harry Potter into, uh, into Georgian and is, uh, is a very much a, a pro-Europeanist. I think that's fair to say, isn't it, David? And so, um, and so we're going to start with, um, with David. We're going to go around. Um, I'm going to talk to the authors for about 10 minutes each, and then they'll, be, they'll each read a piece, and then there'll be a bit more chat, and then it's over to you to, for, uh, for questions and, uh, at the end. So we'll be here for about an hour, an hour and a, just over an hour, depending uh, how things go. And um, so, David, you um, tell us a bit, can you, can you put some context on this for us about where we are with um, what's happened in the last, uh, well, since 1991, since the end of the Soviet era? Yeah. So uh, uh, when I'm asked to speak about Georgian literature, I, I, I always start with these two funny facts that no, we are not Russians, uh, and no, Georgian is not a Russian language. So it's, it's a totally different language. So just to give the brief introduction to it, because Georgian is a totally different language. Uh, uh, and that's the first thing. But uh, that's true that we have been under this big dominion of Russian Empire for, for a lot of time, and then been a part of Soviet Union, which, of course, uh, had its influence on Georgia in every aspect. And, but uh, since 1991, after the fall of the Soviet Union, everything has suddenly changed. And uh, for, for a, to give you a brief context of it is that uh, in, in Georgian, we have an expression, dark 90s. We call the 90s dark 90s because they were literally dark. Uh, with the no electricity, uh, with the collapsed economy, and so on and so on. But I'm not going to talk about sad things right now. We're all sick and tired of, of sad things, I, I understand. Uh, but these were the important times. On one hand, uh, the Soviet censorship was over, the official censorship was over, and there was a huge freedom uh, given to, to the authors to write whatever they wanted, and that was never possible before before the fall of the Soviet Union. Well, of course, in 30s, in 40s, it was uh, really harsh. Uh, and later on in those years, in, in uh, Soviet times, it was not so harsh, but still, I mean, the total freedom and total uh, lack of any kind of censorship only started in 90s. And thus, uh, every, uh, on one hand, there was no um, economic possibility to publish a lot of books uh, and then the books were not sold really. Uh, people had no money for food, but at the same, on the other hand, there was this total freedom. And that's where this new boiling process started in Georgian literature. And I'm happy uh, we're uh, having uh, as one of our panelists here, Aga Morchiladze, the right, uh, Georgi Ahledyani and his, uh, well, uh, the, the readers know him by his pen name, Aga Morchiladze, and who was one of the key figures who, who appeared in the 90s for the first time on Georgian literary scene and uh, started this new Georgian literature, so to say. So this is just a brief uh, context, brief, um, not, not, not very particular, but so, so to say that that's how it all started uh, with the and how, how difficult was it? The, um, it sounds like the economy was in a terrible state. So how, how, where, how were people able to publish? Was there a, uh, it was just that yearning for expression? which, which made... <laughs> that, that was interesting because at the same time, uh, people started to self-publish. Yeah. Uh, very often people, because uh, that was not possible in Soviet times. So it was like, Everything was state owned, everything was ruled by the state and you were not just, uh, even if you had money, you could not just publish. So the books published in 90s were of extremely poor quality, uh, the publishing quality, I mean, but they were still published. And um, this sense of, this totally new sense of freedom was so exciting at the same time and uh, that you were so that's how it started and by the end of 90s new publishing houses started to appear so new modern type uh, publishing houses who 
who uh, tried to uh, catch up with the world uh, of publishing in, uh, with these European experiences and so on and so on, but only in the end of 90s. And it, it seems to me that um, Georgia is, is fascinating for many reasons in, in terms of its literature, uh, in, in that so many different genres seem to have been condensed into such a small space of time. It seems like you've almost got a, a century or more of, of influences all happening in the in the last in the last 25, 30 years. Is, uh, so have you seen have you seen a, a, a lot of different movements uh, in terms of writing in in prose and poetry in, mm -hmm. uh, since yep. the early nineties? So in, in what, what were one another thing that started in nineties was that we were allowed to read what was prohibited in Soviet times. So uh, there were lots of authors we've never heard of before, or just a few literary critics or scholars would know the names of. And then, uh, because the new Russian translations, lots of Russian translations uh, started to appear on the Georgian book market and people uh, got to know them, those authors. I mean, uh, for example, I'll give you an example of, of uh, beatnik poets, beatnik poetry that was impossible, um, the American beat, uh, beat poetry. Uh, it was completely uh, impossible to, to read them or to publish them in Soviet times, but in 90s it was made possible. And a lot of younger poets in Georgia, especially male poets, so started to translate them and sort of, not. I would not say copy them, but uh, they were so much influenced by this uh, sense of freedom and the spirit of freedom of beat poetry so all those things, uh, all those um, periods or, or movements in, in world literature we were not part of. In 90s, the Georgian literature start, uh, attempted to somehow catch up and to compensate. So I would say that the 90s were the uh, decade of compensation when we were trying out different things uh, that we didn't have access to uh, before that. Must have been, and, and, and what sort of movements did you see emerging? I think I think that um, the women's right. We'll come, we'll come onto that with uh, more with, with Acre, but uh, I understand that uh, um, that women's um, writing became particularly prevalent. Was that from the start, or was that something which came a bit later? Well, it's a bit, it's a bit later. So yes, or uh, there have been uh, female authors. Uh, in, in 19th century even, and it, well, it's quite a patriarchal country still, I would say. I, we, I, I, we need to admit that. But um, women start to publish, uh, uh, it's more, more uh, end of 90s when women started, a lot of women started to emerge, like younger women and younger generation of women. Before that, it was like, you know, women were mostly in children's literature and some of them in poetry and very few of them in prose, in fiction. And that, that's the, uh, that was the reality we, and we have to face it. But um, with this uh, possibility of uh, publishing yourself online in, uh, in the 21st century, so a lot of new uh, female names started to appear. So it's, the correlation is very obvious. So, uh, yeah. Women were not, uh, they hadn't, uh, they didn't have to go through the institutions and uh, like the writers union in Soviet times or something like that. So that's why when the access is free, so here you have women in Georgian literature, they start to appear and now we are coming closer to, to the equality in, in numbers, in numbers of uh, female and male authors which was very uh, atypical. Uh, it was not uh, the same in Soviet times or even in 90s. And what, what are, who, who are the, um, the key authors and, and are there any particular themes which, uh, which have developed? Um, um, is, 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 is it crime? Is it uh, historical fiction? Uh, is it, is it postmodernism or is it socialist realism? Well, can you talk us through a bit of that, the, the authors and the themes which have developed? Yep. yep. So, uh, well, as I've mentioned already, it's uh, quite diverse. The picture was quite diverse. There were some uh, formalistic, so to say, movements in, in 90s, like especially in poetry. So they tried, to, uh, they tried to write and behave as crazy as possible because only because it was possible now in 90s. And they would do all like 
uh, street performances and so on and so on, like quite, quite in, in the spirit of the early 20th century, I would say. But uh, as, for, as for the genres and the topics, so, well, it's hard to judge, it's hard to somehow classify it, but definitely what, what is quite obvious, like so-called postmodernist uh, fiction started to appear, uh, and in all different shapes and genres, I would say. But what is interesting is that uh, the most successful writers, including one of our uh, honorable guests here today, oh. managed to, uh, managed to not, not to just um, copy uh, the, the form, the empty form, but to find the Georgian basis for his postmodernist work. To, uh, to direct his uh, attention or his literary work to the roots where, where he is coming from and where the Georgian literature is coming from. So that's why in his work and in some other writers' works as well. So uh, it's a fantastic reading to read uh, how they create the language, the new language based on the old, based on the century old uh, literary experience, and that's what most was valuable that was created in, in the 90s and is still being uh, written. But we are quite quite poor in the so-called genre uh, writing, so not really develop crime or thriller or so-called that those, those uh, unfortunately, which is quite unfortunate, and some of us are trying to to make it up somehow and to fill the gap in it but <laughs> we're we still in the process of of um of forming so to say or developing still still finding the voices and one more thing is important because uh, georgia is quite quite a tiny country but there are not there are not so many of us who write read uh, write and read in georgian and that's why you know the development of book market well, uh, uh, we, we'd love to have it better here. So that's why, you know, it's, it's not a commercial thing. Uh, that's why maybe the genre is not developing really so much like crime or thriller or some other horror or whatever it is, so. That's, that, that's, that's really fascinating. I, um, uh, Gio, you, I mean, apart from being one of the, the country's leading authors, you're, you're also a very eminent historian as well. Um, oh, yeah, historian. <laughs> I just graduated from his <laughs> history <laughs> department. Yeah. History. Okay, sorry. <laughs> oh no. It's, so, would, would you would you agree? Is, would you agree with that overview, or is there anything else which you would which you would add to that that to uh, to Daphit's, uh, overview of what's happened in the in the post Soviet era? Uh, I agree, of course. Generally, I agree. That's right. I remember the picture, but. Uh, uh, my thing was a bit different because I was not a poet, I was not a modernist, I, I, I never tried that. But uh, I agree about language, because uh, growing up, reading Georgian novels of Soviet time, and we had wonderful writers, I disliked the language, because I, I, had the I, I was a boy and I had a feeling, and that's not true, because around, it, it was quite naive, but <laughs> it was the thing. People around speaking a different language. And in the books, in the novels, which you like, language is different. Mm. It's not, it's somehow, for, but there were some restrictions, for example. Uh, 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 for example, the dialects were not tolerated, for example. Slang was totally, totally <laughs> censored, and so on and so on. There were some, some very such technical things which you can do. It would be a Soviet right, even in the 70s and 80s. And when our time started after all this perestroika, what I have first done uh, when I first finished my first novella or short novel or something like that, I wrote it on city slang, most harsh city <laughs> slang. I was 26 years old. And I, first thing I did, uh, it was so natural for me, so natural. So then, then I started with another, another, I did a lot of pastiche in, in my works and I really enjoy it. Uh, uh, that's the thing. And of course, another side is plots. Now, uh, in Stalin times, most harsh times for writing, and Stalin himself read the books himself.
uh, and even edited some of the plays, for example, right? He changed the endings, changed the characters, <laughs> because he thought, you know, the communists, communists thought that um, art is just only you know, for propaganda, nothing more. Yeah. So he did it himself many times. And that's why we had some cliches, which, which, which you can't, for example, you spoke about jam fiction. How the damn jam fiction would be in Soviet Union uh, if you can't uh, find, for example, the uh, gangster to be the main character there? Protagonist, <laughs> it never do that. Only police officer, only very right. It was a third-rated literature in Soviet Union writing. We call it detectives in Soviet time. No crime, no mystery, just detectives. <laughs> and we all, yeah, and we uh, we read the. Classic, very few classic. We, we, we read a lot of Sherlock Holmes and knew that that's something very interesting and quite. Um, we didn't knew at, uh, know at the time that it's Victorian. We thought it's quite romantic and different guy. But uh, Soviet detectives, ugh, that's very ideological. Too many restrictions to be good. Yeah. So. Uh, and then. So there are many moments. If we carry yeah. on with that, we'd never finish. So, <laughs> so. And, and, and I think um, the Western influences have come in uh, to, to particularly your writing. Um, how, how, how have they expressed themselves? What, what's uh, the... I think uh, I, I I know that sentence. It's written somewhere in the encyclopedias or somewhere about me somewhere in some country. That uh, talk towards uh, West. That uh, I don't think that that's true. Oh. I don't think because that, that's why you, if you are a good reader, in so even so times, so you know the you knew the leading forms of novel. Well, I was a student. Despite that, we are not. A, for example, first time I heard about Borges, it, it was 1997. It was the very first time, and in Soviet Union, it, he was published. We even didn't know the name of such author. You can understand. Yeah. Uh, we read a lot of Faulkner, for example, but a couple of things were not translated. Yeah. yeah. Uh, unknown reasons why, <laughs> for example. Uh, and they heavily were censored, even the Hemingway's books who was the lovely author in Soviet Union, and he was some way pro-Soviet. But even from his books, where the pieces were cut, that was cut. But uh, you, as a future professional, you got the form. For example, there was a Russian uh, magazine, monthly magazine, foreign literature. And there were quite good uh, American writers, from, People from different different kind, mostly so, socialist bloc, but there were also the Western writers. And I remember how I, yeah, how, how I read Doctor O, for example, and it was impressive. Mm -hmm. There were some holes there. <laughs> you go and get, get, get what you need, but it was not yeah. enough, of course. The, the, then it was opened, and of course, uh, writing is. For us, it's more Western thing. We have the very strong passion tradition, mm. but it's still, still, but it's a country of poetry. And, and you're, um, you've written more than 20, 20 novels in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the last 25 or so years. How, how do you think that your own work has evolved in that time? You said that when you first started writing, uh, you know, you really wanted to, to write using slang and the language is a great, you know, you, you know, work changed, you think, the way you express yourself? Yes, of course it changed. I always tried to do something new mm -hmm. in a form and in language because uh, I think that writing is quite enjoyable thing and you have to enjoy what you're writing. If you're writing 45 stories about, I don't know, 
names of police officer. It's quite boring. <laughs> with full respect to that gentleman, I tried with. Uh, I told you that with pastiche, nineteenth uh, century, even tenth century language. Of course, it's mimicking. It's not real thing, but you're playing inside that. You're getting a lot of plots from forgotten novels, changing them, playing. So it was the my first books were more such uh, harsh, open-hearted books. Now uh, they, they they are more such. I think they are more clever. Mm. Uh, and when when you're growing up as an author, for example, it's a funny and lovely thing for me uh, to make dramas I wrote thirty years ago into comedies, <laughs> that's, that's lovely, that's lovely looking back and joking about that, what you thought was so serious at the time. I, I, I get the impression that, sort of, that talking to you both that, um, that there's a real kind of experimentation, the joy with sort of playing with literature and uh, experimenting is coming, is coming to the fore through this freedom of expression. Uh, the, the, the fans uh, for, aren't there. It's very personal but for me. Literature is that thing to be enjoyable for writer. Yeah. yeah. If you are working like a slave there, you work in some way like a slave, and you need such pages when you need paragraphs and words, you know, a lot of to, to to put it into novel. But on another way, it's enjoyable thing. So, so Aker, you, you, you um, what do you make of the um? That analysis of, of what's happened in the, uh, the post-Soviet era, would you uh, would you agree with that? Is there anything that you particularly add to it from your perspective? What happened uh, uh, after post-Soviet era? You yeah. asked. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I think that we became uh, more brave, uh, um, and we we began to write more bravely. Mostly, I can talk about women writers, may, maybe in Georgian women writers, because. They somehow they the, their language is uh, more free now and um, uh, um, uh, and uh, they are free in um, uh, inside uh, their feelings. They can tell whatever they want to say, and this is very good sign for me. But you know they are children of the small country and they are shining on only on uh, Georgian sky. You know nobody knows what they are writing. But this is this is the thing what I uh, what I like most of all uh, in contemporary Georgian literature that they uh, now they avoid cliches. Mostly I'm speaking now about Georgian women poets. And really now we have brilliant uh, women poets. I can list like at least 10, 10 of them who are. Uh, who, if they will be translated, I don't know, in any international language, in English or in another language, they, the world literature, I think, uh, will will be enriched with with their poetry. So this is the just one one small thing what I say. And with your work, um, now your background is as a as a journalist, um, uh, an investigative journalist um, as well. Uh, do you think this has got an influence on your poetry, this uh, this, this journalistic side of your your character? Um, so, if do you, do you write about social topics, for example? Mm -hmm. This is, you know, this is mostly the uh, um, frequent uh, asked question for me. Uh, how do you write uh, if you? every day dig and uh, research and do this journalistic job and i'm a re news reporter uh, and um, i do this job from as i uh, already mentioned from morning to late uh, evening and yes of course it's um, it can't really um, you can't really avoid that uh, in the beginning it was not uh, so i was writing about i don't know deep feelings and love uh, as every beginner poet, maybe, but now mm, uh, influence is uh, visible of of, uh, of journalism. Uh, and besides that, you know, I belong to to the authors who want to distance themselves uh, from true true stories. Uh, and I, I love actually writing about the, those true stories. In journalism, uh, everything has to be precise, very 
very, um, how to say, uh, careful without too many emotions. And here in literature, especially in poetry, I have, um, I have more freedom, more, more space to breathe. Um, what about social issues? Recently, I've been writing more of social political poetry and uh, I feel like I have, um, how to say, I have uh, awakened the uh, citizen uh, type of uh, poet uh, in me to say so. So is, is your poetry then a form of escapism as well? Is, is there an escapism in your poetry or, or, uh, or do, is it a mix of the reality and escapism? How, how, do you, how do you feel that works, that, that, uh, that works? Mm, escapism. Uh, somehow, I don't know. Uh, I, you know, I, I write about poor people, for example, who travel with uh, rusty transport. Metro people who usually are also poor in Georgia. I wrote, uh, wrote, write about um, careless politicians, for example, or wealthy church about abortion, women, violence, I can't write about an unrealistic world. Mm. Uh, however, I think that this is, this is a partly es escapism as well. That, that, that's how I distance myself from this reality, by, um, how to say, by expressing the sad reality. Yeah, yeah. And what's... Um... You're also, you also um, have written a volume of short stories, apart from the, uh, uh, is, is, is that, is, how, are they very different, your short stories, to your poems in, in, in terms of the themes? Or is there, is there, is there something in common between the, the short stories and the poetry? Uh, no, I think that there are some connections between yeah. them. What I can't put in poetry, because poetry is poetry, you know, uh, and uh, what I the can't put in that, somehow I continue it in these uh, short stories. I'm beginner in prose and I'm, uh, I don't know what will be, whether I will continue in this uh, uh, field or not, but uh, the, uh, the decision why, um, why this my last book is published was that uh, um, I, uh, how to say, um, there was no space what I wanted to say in my poems. Yeah. Uh, and I wanted some um, bigger um, field, you know? Yeah, you needed need, need, need a different medium, a different form of expression. To, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But, but the topics, uh, what about I'm writing and uh, in these short stories and want to write in, in the future, well, I don't know what will be, uh, again, is connected with the real life. Yeah. Thank you very much. And um, we're going to hear some, uh, hear you read um, after it's uh, fairly soon. But back to David. And um, I think, David, you're going to read a... Um, an extract for us from uh, some of your work. Would you like to introduce the yep. piece you're going to read, and then we'll have a we'll have a chat about it. Yep. So it's a short extract from my novel. Uh, the literal translation uh, of the title would be "Falling Apart," but believe me, it sounds better in Georgian. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot be just. Uh, I tried to cross out a lot just to make it short, but without further ado, uh, well, it's about a guy who is observing his neighbors' lives, because he's idle, he has nothing to do, he's unemployed, and he's spending the hot summer in his block of flats and observing the neighbors' um, sexual free life, and ending, sort of, and uh, once he becomes a uh, witness of, of, a, of a murder, I would say. So that's, that's him going to that flat, uh, discovering the body. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Now he's lying dead and clean shaven in the other room. They say that people's beards, hair and nails keep on growing after death, but that takes time. He's only just died. His body lying on the white rug, his corpse, his body, so much blood, but it's all stayed on the carpet. It's thick and absorbs the blood. It's soaked with it. I've got to make sure that he's really dead. Oh, come on, he's not breathing. And he's not, if he's not breathing, that means he's dead. That's it. But still, maybe he's breathing and I can't see it, but his belly isn't moving, neither his chest. No, no, no pulse. He's dead. So why hasn't the blood stopped? How much is there left to come? 
how many liters of blood do people have? What if it gets on the floor too? What if it seeps through the floor and stains the downstairs neighbor's ceiling? He's warm. He's definitely not breathing, but he still really looks as if he's alive. I wonder if there's a mirror somewhere, a pocket mirror. I can put it over his mouth, and if it steams up, if it steams up, it means he's alive. Oh, forget the mirror. He's got no pulse. No pulse equals to death. Bits of broken base, bookshelves practically empty, just a few books, old ones, no television. Bed is a mess, not a bed, armchair, a fold-out armchair, messy but not dirty. The blood did not go to uh, did not go that far. Why isn't it stopping? Isn't he dead? I press my fingers to his neck a bit harder. I press down and suddenly there it is, a pulse. I'm not imagining it, am I? No, it's definitely beating. I can't feel it. What if he asks me to help him? What do I do? Call an ambulance? Yeah, because if I call now, it, it will definitely get there in time. Right, ha. Huh? God bless our bloody ambulances. Yeah, they'll come, they'll do some tests, they'll start filling in forms and asking me who I am and what I'm doing here, and then they'll call the police. They'll say the body bears uh, the marks of violence and they need to report it. I mean, some marks, all those head wounds and the fragments of vase strewn over the floor. You don't need to be a genius to work out that someone smashed it over his head. I'll get confused and make a run for it and they'll run after me hey, stop, where are you going? And the whole neighborhood will wake up. No, if I don't call, if I just wait a bit, he'll lose all his blood and I won't get caught up in, the, in this. If I'd been somewhere else tonight, if I'd been asleep in bed next to Tina and not seen anything, he'd still have died and it would have nothing to do with me. Why should I call? Why should I do anything at all? How many more liters of blood can there be left? How much more does he have to lose before he dies? Does he have to bleed it all out to the last drop? Or let's say he's only got a, a little bit left. Would that be enough to kill him? What if he starts convulsing? What if he dies and I don't realize? How long before he goes cold? Maybe there's still time to call an ambulance. No, no. I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing. So I hope no one asks me how. Uh, no one asks me now because I won't be able to tell them the answer. But I do know what I'm doing. It's a different sort of knowing. No need to say it out loud. I'll just wait until he dies. Uh, that's it. Uh -huh. You read better in English, you know, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. The, uh, this, this is where you, have to, you have to imagine the rapturous applause from the audience now. I'm sure that was that was great. I really enjoyed that. And I, what I liked so much about one of the things I liked about it was the way in which you took a uh, you, 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 the, the questions, the way in which you uh, the, imag the imagination of the of the uh, protagonist and asking questions: what if, what if, what if? Yeah. Well, a lot of people uh, tell me that that's because I come from theatre. I'm a playwright in the first time. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. So there's another side of your character as well. The um, the man who introduced Harry Potter to to yeah. Georgia. So did well, I didn't. Uh, well, but a slight uh, correction there. I didn't introduce. I did only the second and the third books. Ah, uh, the second and third. I was going to ask you that if you'd done all of them, and uh, oh, no. and uh, the sec so that would be which two were the second and the third ones? That be it wasn't the third. Uh, Secret of Chambers uh, and uh, Prisoner of Azkaban. Yeah. And Rich, we got a question Chamber about. Chamber of Secrets. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and um... Rich, we've got a question about uh, that. Oh. All right. Okay. Would you like to um, Would you like okay. to ask it, Alex? Yeah, yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm loving this. Uh, this event is brilliant. Um, it's a question from Teo Neparidze. Uh, he oh. says uh, it's just from his son, his 11 year old son. He's asking how long did it take to translate the Prisoner of Azkaban, uh, and also how much have you collaborated with um, translators of previous volumes? Yes. Oh, great question. Thank you. So first of all, I, I, I'd say that I was 21 years old when I did that. That was a long, long time ago. Well, and I was like um, fortunate to, to be given this commission because I was just a beginner, beginner translator and it was a big thing. 
uh, and uh, but it was the easiest book I ever translated in my life <laughs> because it's quite simple. The language is simple. Uh, and uh, well, as for the question, it took me exactly two months of a uh, full-time job. I, I was sitting from like 9 a.m. till at least 6 or 7 p.m. every day translating nonstop. But it was an enjoyable thing to do so. And of course, we all uh, there are other translators to the lady who translated the first book and the ladies and gentlemen who continued after me. We all collaborated with each other because even maybe it would be interesting for your son, Teona, we had a, we had a common glossary of terms of, a, of invented creatures and fictitious creatures and uh, characters, because, you know, you need to be uh, consistent in every book uh, and what, uh, how to translate butter beer for example, or, or the names of the clubs or whatever. So yes, we, we did, we did uh, collaborate. A lot. Just, just a quick question. I'll, I'll be, be here to talk about you and and, um, and Georgia rather than J.K. Rowling. But I'm, yeah. I'm fascinated as someone who's translated J.K. Rowling. It, it's it's said, and I don't particularly subscribe to this opinion myself. That um, some people say that J.K. Rowling is not a great writer. That she's a, a very very good storyteller, um, but that the, the, the writing style is is is, is not uh, particularly good. As someone who's actually translated it and looked at the words in that detail. What's your opinion on that? I wish I could write like that, yeah. <laughs> for, especially for, for teenagers and especially for children. I wish I could, but unfortunately I can't. Well, uh, as for those two books I have translated, and especially my favorite one is The Prisoner of Azkaban. I think it's so brilliantly well written. I mean, it's it's like rock and roll. It's whirling and twirling. It's it's really well written, in my uh, in my opinion. I don't know, maybe because maybe I'm not a native speaker. That's why. And we tried to do it to the same in in uh, Georgian translation to make it as clear and as um, with this good natural flow as possible. Thank you so much, Tavi. So I'm going to move on to uh, on to Gio now, and you're, you're going to read us a piece. Um, uh, we, we, what are you going to read us? We, we, which book is it from? Would you like to introduce it, Gio? Uh, I read well. I'm not a great voice actor, quite frankly, even in Georgian. So, so we, it's a dead thing, Frank. It in English, <laughs> but, but, but but anyway, everybody knows. That. The guys know that the <laughs> church is like, I can't read. I, I, I'm running ahead while reading because it's <laughs> But anyway, it's very, very first my book, Journey to Karabakh, uh, which is the only book in English. Uh, I have just noticed first time that it's published in a small publishing house. I thought it was in the in United States, but it has inscription, Champagne, London, Dublin, but no United States. But I thought that it was... <laughs> well, anyway, it was written uh, 28 years ago. So it's a very first page of the novel I have ever written. Very, very first. So I'll try. It's kind of a crime thing. It's not such <laughs> very lovely. Oh, by the way, uh, when you spoke about publishing, how how you published it, uh, the first edition of this book in Georgian uh, was published in the print section of the mental hospital in, in uh, 1993. And uh, I paid it, it was a self-publishing, and I paid not money, yeah. but a paper. Uh, and the amount was written there and stamped. My friend gave it to me, and <laughs> that was strange. Bit. So, so I'll start because uh, time is running out. Yeah, okay. First chapter. It all started at the end of February. Georgia was at war with itself, if you can tell what we had a war. President had just fled the country in any case, chased out by the National Guard and paramilitaries of the horsemen. I didn't care about any of that back then, and I care even less about it now. 
it was the end of February, and all I could think about was Kogelik. Kogelik is a French Georgian name of one of the, yeah. And his latest stupid idea. He wouldn't stop going on about it. Come on, man. He'd say, let's go, let's go. Achiko Kipiani will give us the money. All we have to do is take it and go. But they just couldn't be bothered driving back and forth all over the goddamn place and in winter to boot. Why on earth would I want to? Anyway, you couldn't buy guns for love or money back then. But he wouldn't let up. Come on, let's go, let's go. All we have to do is drive there, pick up the grass, and we'll be stoned till next autumn for free. Blah, 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 blah. I didn't want to go. I hadn't been into that stuff for ages. I might fancy a smoke maybe four or five times a year, maximum. And how dare he think he can drag me halfway across Azerbaijan anyway? I'm not a kid anymore. You go, you go, you bring it back, and then you can tell everyone how you went to Ganja and come back with a load of hush. Ganja, yeah, I got it in Ganja, then it's right, man. I bought back a load of drugs from Ganja and on and on and on. But he just kept going on about it. Come on, come on, man, drive me to Ganja. And once Gogli gets an idea, he can't let it go. Stupid bastard. Anyway, eventually he left, he left, but later that night he came back with that Achiko Kipiani in tow. Kipiani is a big guy, built like a buffalo. He said they are fiddling with a set of four beads. Okay, here he said to me, look, None of the dealers in Azerbaijan will sell to me anymore, the bastards. You are government friends, and that makes you my friend too. Come on. It's a couple of days. That's all. I'll make it worth your while. He's uh, persuasive like that. What about guys I asked? I'd already decided to go. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, can't, I, I, I can't read well because <laughs> anyway, I, I, I found both both of the readings fascinating, and, and that that one, in a sense, I was really not expecting hmm. that. Um, <laughs> and I suppose that you could simply not have written that in the Soviet <laughs> era. Yes, yes, <laughs> yeah. Uh, since uh, since very first line, so. <laughs> So was there that real excitement of being able to write something about drug running and Azerbaijan and the, the hash coming in? Uh, that, 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 uh, that, that was an ordinary plot. It's a very trivial plot of my boyhood. Yeah. Uh, uh, I was brought up in a, a neighborhood uh, where uh, the guys who were running for that thing uh, who, who needed a large portion portions of this, all these drugs. They usually go to Azerbaijan or north to uh, Russian towns of North Ossetia. There, there are some places, everybody knew the geographic names of them. So it's very ordinary stuff. But uh, what, what me pushed, there was a thing that uh, uh, I'll say like such a bit um, Italian thing. No, my friend's friend's friend <laughs> and his friend. <laughs> uh, they went there. Uh, they knew nothing about politics, absolutely nothing, but they were arrested by police, but that was not a, a difficult thing usually. You have to pay and it's something. Uh, or uh, one stays there, hostage stays there, another guy comes home and bring the money and police releases it. Uh, that's the thing of that. Yes, but there was a war among Armenia and Azerbaijan for Karabakh. And the police station was heavily bombed that night. And these guys, absolutely, <laughs> they, they just didn't understand what was going on. And when they returned, my friend's 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 friend told me the story. <laughs> and the beginning inspired, 
it was inspiration. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you so much for reading that. So that was the first, the, the beginning of your first, your first book. Yes, first, yes. no, first ever uh, thing I have finished. That's, 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 uh, that, that, I was writing since boyhood, but never finished. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Privilege. When you're a boy, you, you need these grand things, <laughs> masterpieces. <laughs> you never pass fifth page. That, that, thank that you is. so much for uh, thank you that with us. And, and Aka, what would you um? What would you like to read uh, uh, this evening? Um, okay, I wanted to read one political uh, poem about Prime Minister, but it's too long. So I changed my mind and I will uh, read for you another one, which is from my social poetry um, uh, poems. Uh, the name of it, uh, A Song of a Miner's Wife. My husband is going to come home late tonight, my smoked husband. As he comes, his teeth will glear white. Only from the teeth I can differ my husband from others. He was light-skinned when I first met him. Now the color of his skin is near to the color of dust. Even his voice sounds as if the iron has dissolved in it and his eyes are lit up with the heated oil. My husband changes a lot after being back to, his, to this world from a long tunnel deep. Now he will come soon. He will be muddy. He will enter the doorway bringing some smell. That's the smell from the intestines of earth. This is the smell of the men working side by side with him, that of the exhausted workers. He will come soon with an empty food container in the hand, one hand, and with a smoked loaf of bread in another. The essence of my husband has touched even a loaf of bread like me before and made it black after he had eaten a small piece of bread when he got hungry on the way home. Later, he sits at the table waiting for a long time for his portion of soup that is followed by some of my words to be said quickly about the big loans from banks and small ones from the local grocery store and about a new pair of shoes belonging to a neighbor's child and our children's shabby school bags. There are my words of despair. He is still sitting looking through the window to the sky. Then he says, I miss the sky and stops to talk. I stopped to say a word about the books and coloring books and chocolates and new dresses and the necklace over the in the window of the shop. In short, about everything a human being needs. And I think if only he would never lose his hands and feet to be able to go down in the mine. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's. Um... That was fantastic. And is, is, is that um, well, two, two, two questions? One, how difficult is it to read the poems in English and how do they translate from the Georgian? Would you like to, to read a few lines in Georgian so we can get some sense of the of the um, of what it sounds like? <laughs> It's uh, for me. It's it's not easy, but I don't know uh, whether it, this uh, very translation uh, how how it sounds in English for you for a native speaker. You know, is it good translation or not? But um, I'm trying to to read good, but uh, it it's difficult for me really. Uh, in Georgian, of course, it's much more easier. And um, yeah, I love reading, uh, but not very um, often. But um, when I have my own readers and I know that they they know my poetry and they um, come to listen to me, in these cases I love to read. Yeah. Would you Would you like to read a few lines in Georgian so we can get some sense of what it sounds like in your native language? Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, if I read now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So yeah. yeah. um, um, Okay, uh, I do not have this very uh, poem, but uh, oh. I read uh, another one. It's uh, for you. Simartle Jobia, Meruza de da Menatreba Gamovarib Holme Panjaras, the Shubs Wushwer, Shubswer Hires. Zaidan Hats Modis Kari, the Magris Tahashim Twers. Holome Huchautwalstam, you divar Dedastam. Iswerm Hedavs, Meki, 
چونی از اون سعی بیت میوده وگ میواد سیلپ سام سخورم د. مقرب رگور واخلو د بگذت بیشی خورست بازار سخیت مغازی است خانو پروسیس کابینت تند کاسات زورولی خانو او قبلا غمرت خانم د. مقرب شم تخویت در دبردس. دلچه معرفت سی در صندای صدس توالب سرم خوچ او چند دبی میسکردید. سامزار اولس مگی دستن چومات کوتخش. داشه مقرب میس خلیس متعونبس میشه سرپ تماس میس مرت آباس. دوست داده چه می دونیم؟ می توانیم سوخته داد برند. میروت هم بالا درست داد خیرات من در بابی خب تلفن است داد او رفت می ساخت سیاش. داد من در بابی سری سی تو امید داوود خرده گاوتیش. مرا کی بیتی رو ترت ترد کن رگور تیک نبود خار. دی دی خور بگیاری سامی سخیاره با مگرام. آمیز مگی برات و اوب نبی. داد. رام دنی کوزی شکاری داد. رام دنی تیگوی ماریلی. در رام دنی تو اتی تابلو. آه، خیلی خوب. I, I, I always think that with poetry, even if you don't understand the, the language, you can, you can take something from the, the way in which it's read. And that was very much the, the case in that reading. It was, uh, that was a very powerful reading. It's, uh, so thank you for doing that. So it's, uh, that was great. Thank and, you. Um, and the translation worked really well. As a, as a, you know, as a, uh, I think that the... Uh, as for an English audience, that came across really well. It must be so difficult to translate poetry, particularly from one language into another, with the because you and to keep the uh, the rhyme structure and the meter and all of that. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and and it's a luxury for us poets um, to have um, translations, you know, because yeah. poetry is not so. Is there is there a tradition of um, of poetry in Georgia pre pre the Soviet era? Is there a is, is, is there a, a history of, of poetry? Yes, a quite long, uh, I think quite long um, history of poetry we had, and we had the really great uh, poets, poets uh, um, in the 20th century, but, um, but I think that as David mentioned, um, after 19, uh, 19th, uh, um, maybe David will speak about this better than me, but after 90s, uh, I don't know, some generation came in Georgian poetry, uh, men and women uh, poets who, who changed, um, uh, had changed everything, who changed the culture of writing, I think. Yeah, it's, 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 I find it so fascinating that you're, you're, you, the three of you and others are, are in a, a, a culture which is, changing so quickly and you're in your you're part of this it must be such an exciting time it sounds like such an exciting time to be a uh, to be a writer a, an author or a, a poet so i'm just conscious that we've um we're just coming up to seven o'clock here so uh so we've been going for an hour or so so uh um alex do you, have you got um you've been keeping an eye on the chat so yeah. have we got uh, have we got any other questions or comments that uh mm. you'd like to you'd like to put to us. Gosh, it's Definitely. quite a lot there, isn't there? People are, uh, people are finding the readings really powerful and very moving. And uh, my, I, my uncle Jim was a coal miner, and I, it just made me wonder if my aunt had ever had those thoughts herself. You know, it was, it was very powerful. Um, Helen's asking about translations into English. So are they available outside Georgia? How can people get hold of them? All authors, all three panellists. Well, some of them are, uh, uh, are, well, my book is not translated yet. What I read, it was just a sample translation made by my very good friend, Adam Smart. Uh, but uh, I hope that someday, well, it's published in Germany. If you speak German, if you read German, you can find it in Germany, but uh, unfortunately not, not in English yet. But I, I hope that's yet to come. <laughs> but uh, uh, Eka's works and Kyo's works are translated and available, I think, right? No, they are in my poems are only in anthologies, in the in several anthologies, but they are not sold in Amazon. So uh, I think, I, I don't think how people can get it. It's uh, this book, for example, A House With No Doors, uh, 10 Georgian um, women poets. Uh, it was translated by Natalia Bukia Peters and Victoria Field. Maybe it can be uh, somewhere, I don't know. Hmm. As I wow. mentioned, uh, uh, we have only a few translations like in, um, as, as, a, as a whole book and um, our poets' um, our poems are only in anthologies, so 
hard to find them. And Gio, I think your your work is is available, isn't it? As you said, no, only one book and maybe some pieces in anthologies if they are. Only one book that we're interested. Uh, uh, translating in English and publishing in England. It's another long story. We have more open way in German language world. Yeah. <laughs> where the Georgians are quite widely published. Yeah. But wow. in, in internet, there are some extracts, no, uh, of our translations of your. Um... Maybe I have ne never checked. That. So I ask about books. I know only one book. There out. are some few translations which we have never published at that time. I, I, I'm, I'm Mostly I'm in Germany. Checking the chat here, and the lady posted the link where you could, the people who are interested can buy the anthology you mentioned, the Ten Georgian Women Poets. So, mm -hmm. so those who are interested, that there is a link for you there in, in the. Ah, chat. okay. So great. Uh, I'm there. just going to. Uh, an, uh, another anthology also. Rich, I think place, place. Rich, maybe we but could. I put don't the, have the link. We could put the existing ones up on the website afterwards or at least yeah, yeah we can do that we can uh, I've, I've, i have uh, there's i was hoping that there may be a published from london in uh with us tonight i don't think they're here but i just put uh, francis bootle publishers uh, yeah francis has been putting up a couple of links while you've been talking oh he is he's here good yeah he's, excellent he's yeah, so, there, so um there, there are some links on the on the chat there um so uh, just just before i ask the next question um why German? What, what, what's, the, what's the link with Germany? Is, uh... you uh, want uh, there, there are many reasons there. There are many yeah. reasons. Yeah. yeah, but the main, the great thing that happened two years ago in 2018 was in Frankfurt. Uh, as you know, uh, that the people who are connected with the book publishing, yeah. they know what Frankfurt Book uh, Fair means. It's huge. And uh, Georgia was the guest of honor country in 2018. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And well, be, even before that, like uh, years and years earlier, we had these cultural connections with Germany. I mean, it didn't start on Frankfurt, of course, but uh, for the this Frankfurt guest appearance, there were a lot of new translations made, like uh, latest five or six or seven years. There have been tons and tons of like almost all authors <laughs> are translated. Uh, living or dead, the classics and the contemporary authors into German. For so lucky you who can read German. So all <laughs> our books are available in German. <laughs> so go ahead. So Gio's books, like several of his books, like more than five at least. So yeah. Six. yeah, they are publishing every year. Yeah. So every year, uh, new, one or two. Like his that. new book is coming out in Germany every year. So all these books are available in Germany or in German language. So that's why. So Alex, I think I've, I think I noticed a few um, uh, more questions. Uh, yeah, I've got one here for Eka. This is from Richard Devere. He's saying, Eka, is there much performance poetry in Georgia? Mm, not much, too much. Well, whom I remember, maybe Zura Tveliashvili we had, who is doing uh, performance poetry, right? Maybe my colleagues will agree with me and. Uh, um, maybe Shalva Bakuradze, who is singing uh, his poetry. Um, I don't know. Uh, I think we do not have this tradition. Or um, uh, I, I can't list the reasons of this, but uh, no, on, I, I remember only these two, these two poets. They, they were, uh, this performance poetry was very popular in 90s. In 90s, yeah. yeah. Well, David Chichladze's... Uh, <laughs> Performance theater, um, yeah, we began, but uh, but now no, I think, and even new generation, they do not, uh, they don't do this performance poetry. They just write and read. Okay, we've got a, a question from past and present press. Oh, that's Mike, Mike Manson. That's from Mike. So Mike's asking, has COVID affected your writing? This is to all panelists. Has it given you more time to write or have you felt locked down? Tavi, would you like to start with yeah. that one? Then we'll go then, then Gio, then Aker. Well, uh, uh, people think that if you're, if you're at home, you don't have to do any work of yours, but it's, it's, it's not true. Uh, it's getting, 
And personally for me, it's been uh, this lockdown and these restrictions have been like, you are working from home and you are, uh, you, I mean, I, I, like, I cannot write at home. I need to go somewhere. Yeah. And when there is nowhere to go, that means zero writing. So that's how it has been with me in, in those since March earlier this year. So zero writing, a lot of work. And so that's why I don't particularly like this bloody pandemic, please. <laughs> <laughs> pandemic writing, that, that's an interesting thing. Uh, well, well uh, this year I have a lot of side writing which I consider not my writing, but writing for money, quite frankly. Uh, so it's good in some way you are sitting, but you are stuck there you, and you can't lie that it be two weeks or in one month. <laughs> Every three days, these, these guys check you. <laughs> How many pages <laughs> have you done? For example, scripts or, or other, any other stuff. We are doing a lot of stuff from sides. So in that way, in yeah. that way, it, it's not quite comfortable. Eka? As for me, uh, we do not, uh, we, we did not uh, have lockdown in journalism, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so when, uh, when you, we are sitting at home, we are running in the street. Yeah, oh, yes. <laughs> So yeah, but in the beginning, you know, I um, I have had a hope that maybe I will find some some time to finish something where I where I begin. Mm. But no, no. So Alex, what, what else we've got there? We lots of really positive comments, guys. People are saying a fantastic evening, brilliant, so so interesting. Um, Tom Mason's asking, uh, how has the literature that's come out post nineteen ninety one? How has it explored the themes of independence? Oh, quite a lot. There are, you know, there have been. Uh, uh, well, I mentioned that the new literature started in nineties, but we should not forget about the writers who were already there. Uh, mm. and were already well-established writers, and there are few names who are really important, uh, even up to date, uh, important authors. And those uh, poor guys, uh, sorry for mentioning them like that, it's not very quite rude of me, but uh, those poor guys uh, finally had a chance to, to, to not to be allegoric or invent some ancient story <laughs> directly, directly about, um, about Russian-Georgian relationships or imperialism or whatever they wanted. So, uh, yeah, uh, that there has been uh, a lot of reflection on what independence means for Georgia. And since it's a, it's a very tough issue for Georgians in general, you know, because all Georgian identity through last two centuries was centered around it. The, the nation that strived towards regaining its independence. And, yeah. that's and all was, our complexes are yeah, related yeah. to this. That's why I was so always so past oriented to the glorious golden age, to the medieval times. And finally it came and uh, it did not turn out to be what we expected. And it, it, it turned out to be harder than expected. And that's, that's where, where the literature comes in with interesting reflections of it. So it's a vast issue. It's really huge. Gio, would you like to add anything to that on the theme of independence? Mm, no, I think I, I, I agree in that way, because it was, uh, I remember that years when it started, the middle of the 80s, and it was so romantic and so golden, go, go, golden, I can say, that reaching that thing. And after that, Many things happen, civil wars, and, but, but the way, the way, was, you never notice anything bad, anything wrong. Many wrong things were done through that thing, but you never notice that. As a, me, as a young man, I thought that two or three of the, they, they were beautiful in that way, that you are breaking all that. Just the ordinary member of some huge mass of people who are in the streets, <laughs> something like that. The, the feeling I remember is that, you know, not more something political. It was magic yeah. that you're reaching every new day. It's a step that you are living that 
damn country. <laughs> just huge. So that's it. And Acre, but would you like? Is, is there anything you'd like to add about the theme of uh, independence and in, 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 uh, how that's affected uh, your, your work? I, I don't remember the emotionally this all events uh, were very very good. No, I think that I and David um, told everything like. Excellent. So Alex, back to you. Oh, we got some we got some really nice comments about the readings. Uh, uh, people were very impressed with all of the readings. Acre, that was beautiful, says Jonathan, and uh, and uh, and uh, Grace agrees. But Alex, you, I, I, you're you're, uh, you're on the chat. So uh, what else? Yeah, we... I mean, it, it, it's still really positive. Wonderful yeah. evening, says Natalia Beglarashvili. Thank you so much to the Bristol Fe Festival of Literature for this opportunity to present Georgian modern literature. Um, fantastic evening. Um, yeah, I mean, it's all really positive, guys, and that, we haven't got any more questions, but just some wonderful comments from everyone. Yeah, so, uh, oh, there is one I just spotted for, <laughs> from Jonathan. That's, that's, yeah. that's, uh, Georgie, did you buy the drugs, and if so, what did you do with them? I have already <laughs> read that. I have never bought drugs. <laughs> never, ever. <laughs> never, ever. I told you, that's my friend's 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 story. <laughs> 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 Is there that's, that's a proper up? thing to say on on live. <laughs> we, are, we, are, we are recording this interview, so <laughs> we were all young ones. <laughs> so, so Alex, is there anything else that you'd like to say from the from the chat? Um, no, it's just just fantastic. It's really positive. I think. Um, we need to check out Francis Bootle Publishers because they've obviously they're they're all over the Georgian literature here. There's a translation of Zurab uh, Tveliashvili, uh, the performance poet that Eka mentioned, for instance. So I think uh, we we definitely uh, encourage people to have a look at their website. So that is fantastic is there anything else that any of you would like to say our, th our three guests all the way from Tbilisi anything else which you'd particularly like to say oh we've got one more question just to finish oh. with it says who who is your favorite author to each of the panelists that's a good oh, one yeah, yeah. oh that's a difficult question to answer and you need to choose one well Currently, currently, I will choose because I have many favorite authors, like starting from Charles Dickens. He was my first favorite author in my life. But uh, now it's Patricia Highsmith. I'm obsessed with her. <laughs> <laughs> I'm literally obsessed with her. Well, Eka can tell. Whom I remember now is John Updike. Ah, yeah. I love his, um, his his novels, but uh, they are all a lot, of course. Dozens, dozens of authors. Like yeah, difficult to answer. But as for the po poets, um, I love uh, American poetry and beatniks, uh, and uh, they are my favorites. Yeah, John. It's, it's, it's fascinating that, you know, we've got John Updike there and Charles Dickens and, you know, it's, yeah. it's, what, a, what a melting pot. You'll know? find many surprises in George. First names is what came to our, our mind. Oh, no, yeah, yeah. You, know, you mentioned the beat poets and, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, it, it does seem that there's a real melting pot in the last, uh, the last two or three decades in, 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 yeah. in Georgia. Yeah. It's, it's, it's fascinating. And um, well, we've um, we've been here for uh, uh, for all, more than an hour now. So um, uh, I'm going to wrap things up now by by thanking you again very very much for joining us tonight. It's been a real it's been a real privilege to speak to you. Um, George, this is the first time that Bristol Festival of Literature has a, had a country partner, uh, and I'm so pleased that uh, that we've been able to speak to you this evening. Uh, the, the readings were great. Your, the answers to the questions were fantastic. Um, thank you to the uh, ambassador for uh, such a warm introduction, and uh, thank you to our audience for uh, uh, for uh, asking such um, uh, such good questions and being so positive. And um, and, th and thank you, Alex, for uh, 
Motor Racing. In fact, Alex, would you, is there um, anything coming up from the um, uh, the Bristol Twinning Association? And is, is there any events coming up or any anything we, you should draw our attention to? Um, it's tricky at the moment, obviously, yeah. the situation. So the, we haven't got any um, public events. We, we will be welcoming uh, the Georgian Ambassador Bristol in a few days' time, which is fantastic. And she's going to be meeting a whole range of... Uh, of different partners across the you know, business sector, um, education, museums, but also uh, people from Encounters Film Festival who've had a three-year collaboration with Georgia, which is fantastic, and obviously yourself, Rich, and, uh, and colleagues from the, the Literature Festival. So that, that's really our next big thing. Once again, thank you so much. Thank you. So thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Brilliant. I know. Bye. Goodbye. Bye bye.